Last week at Second Service, we celebrated Kristen and Ramon who were baptized. And so we want to show you a video uh, of Kristen and that moment. So go ahead and check it out. I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. My Lord. My Lord. And my Savior. And my Savior. Upon that confession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We don't have footage of Ramon getting baptized, but we wanted to share this picture with you all. Um, this is Ramon, and let me just tell you a little bit about him. Uh, Ramon has Down syndrome, and he wanted to celebrate this moment with his church family, uh, but in the moment, it became overwhelming. <laughs> As just watching it, you, or if you've been in the trap, you know how that feels. And so what we did was we actually finished up service, and Ramon got to be baptized in front of his family and a few team members who were in here. Uh, but I wanted to share with you the best part of that was uh, not just that he was baptized, but uh, at that point, um, Collective had ended, and for the most part, we were tearing down. So there were still people in the lobby. We were, we were kind of moving some stuff around. And the moment he burst through those doors, everyone in the lobby started going nuts for him. And you just see this huge smile on, on his face, which is pretty normal for Ramon. Whenever you see him, he's like the happiest and most hopeful person ever. And so last week was just a great Sunday for us. And we've promised you all, if you go to first service and we baptize someone at second, we'll show you the video. We'll tell the story or vice versa. If someone's baptized at first, uh, we'll share it with you at second. So that's what we wanted to do today. And before we get started today, I want to let you know that next Sunday we have a really big announcement. And so I actually teased about this a few weeks ago at our birthday, but I didn't give much details, trying to leave you guys hanging a little bit. But next week, I'll be closing out our We Are Collective series, and we're going to share a big announcement that will impact the future of this church. And so you won't want to miss it, but if by chance you do, if you can't be here next weekend, um, check it out on YouTube. All of our sermons are online. You can go and check it out on podcasts as well. As well. Specifically, um, we actually are on Spotify, which is easier for both Droid and Apple people, so I don't have to make fun of Droid people right now. You can just go on Spotify because uh, I don't know what Droid users use. The world, I guess. I don't know. Um, because they're cooler than us, right? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but we definitely want you to hear that and know what's going on. It'll lead into uh, a really incredible month for us at Collective, but we're going to kind of tell you what that looks like next week. So one of my favorite things to do after the girls go to bed is hang out with my wife and watch cooking shows. Now, specifically, it's competitive ones like Chopped or Top Chef or Guy's Grocery Games or any of the shows where Gordon Ramsay screams at people for an hour. Like, those are our favorites. Now, I don't watch these because I'm a good cook. I am not a good cook. I actually do not like cooking. I actually prefer to do the dishes. So my wife cooks, and I'm, like, doing dishes the entire time. That's much better for me because I hate cooking. But when Ray and I are watching these shows, I can't help but comment and yell at the contestants like I'm a three-star Michelin chef, right? And you do this too, right? You're like, why did you do that? Like, you don't have enough time. Like, you act like you're in that moment. But it doesn't matter how many competitive cooking shows you watch, there is always one element that can make or break the dish they present. Last week, I was watching Catching Up on MasterChef, and there was this episode where they had to cook everything in one dish. So they had one cast iron skillet, and that's what they could use to cook anything they wanted. And so this dude actually cooks a filet mignon with mashed potatoes and asparagus, which is like my dream meal. And it looked incredible. And so he presents it up front. You know, there's always that moment where Gordon Ramsay asks, he's like, how did you want to cook this? And you're like, oh, did he cook it that way? And so he's like, medium rare. And they go and the camera zooms in and like this really suspenseful music comes up, which it's not suspenseful, but in that moment, you're like, what's gonna happen? And he cuts open the steak and it's beautiful. And all the judges start to eat it and they're talking about how delicious it was. But then the guest judge asked the question, you never want to be asked in the cooking show, where's the sauce? Right? He just didn't even do it. He didn't think it was important. He didn't cook anything else with it. And because of that, this dish that they loved, they put him in the bottom three. And they kept saying it was missing something. It was missing that little bit of extra. It was missing the sauce. Now, I love this church, and so I want to talk to you all about an irresistible part of this church's DNA. It's the sauce. It's our value of you belong here. And here's what that means. It means that we are real about our brokenness and real about how Jesus is changing our lives. So we are saying, I'm going to be open about my junk. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to step into the arena. I'm going to be vulnerable. 
I'm going to feel awkward, but I'm going to push through it because Jesus teaches that there's a better way to live when we push those things into the light. You belong here is the sauce that makes this church taste good. Because I've been to a ton of churches, and a lot of good churches follow Jesus, and they'll stand on Scripture, and I'm with them on that. But if they don't have this, I can't be a part of it. I just can't. Now, have you ever experienced something the way it's meant to be experienced? Over the past few summers, we've had friends or other pastors from out of state come up and visit us, come check out Collective. And so, of course, the first thing that we do is we take them downtown. We show them this incredible city. But every single time someone comes to visit us that's not from Maryland, we always make sure to have crabs. Right? We have a crab feast. We grill out, we buy some local beer, and we pick crabs and we eat them until we're not sure we ever want to eat again. It's when that Old Bay, like you smell like Old Bay. And you're like, I think this is in my blood now. And so every summer we invite people to be a part of that with us. And our friends who are out of town always say, I think this is how summer's meant to be. Right? Sitting on the back porch, drinking a good beer, eating crabs, and just having fun. Right? That's summer done the right way. Now, if you went through this past summer and you didn't actually pick crabs until it got dark outside, I'm not sure you even had summer. But I think church is the same way. Once you experience the church the way it's supposed to be, you can't go back to playing church. You can't go back to just getting dressed up on a Sunday and talking about Jesus and going home. See, there was once a community that was so devoted to each other They found grace and truth in Jesus. They realized they didn't deserve it, so they lived in authentic community with one another. They gave freely to each other of their homes, their relationships, their money, and their emotions. When they fell, they would be picked up. When they struggled, they would pray. When they messed up the same way for the 100th time, they would hear, we're not giving up on you. They were tied to each other in a way that once you had experienced it, you couldn't go back to life as usual. The early church didn't have marketing campaigns. They didn't have outreach events. They didn't have a sick social media experience. They just lived in such a way that when people saw it, they said, that's what I want. And because of that, we see in the book of Acts that every single day people saw that, decided they want that, and every single day people were making decisions to follow Jesus. And Collective, I've got to tell you, that's what I experience here. A group of people who live so openly and honestly in their pursuit of Jesus that I can't go back to life any other way, right? I can't go back to the surface stuff. I can't go back to just going through the the motions. I can't go back to just getting the exterior stuff, right, looking good. Because I've experienced something so much deeper and so genuine and life-giving. And I promise you this, if the day ever comes where we lose that, where we collective as a community lose that realness, that I'm out. I'll go find another church. And the truth is, if we ever lose it, it's probably my fault anyways, and I don't think I should be in ministry anymore. Because I don't want to be a part of a church where people are not living in authentic community, where people are open about their mess and their brokenness, where they're picking each other up and running toward Jesus. Because once I found that, I was ruined. And I can't go back to life any other way. In fact, the early church had what I'm talking about And Paul, whose life was actually changed by the early church, was writing a letter to one of those churches in Galatia. Now, Paul was not a follower of Jesus, but he had this experience with God. He received the grace of Jesus. He was baptized, and then he became a church planter. And so he moved from city to city, starting churches and supporting churches. And when he would leave, what he would do is he'd actually send letters back to those churches, trying to challenge them and encourage them to grow. So I'm going to read you what he wrote in Galatians 6, and we're going to go back through, and we're going to pick it apart a little bit. But here's what he wrote to the church in Galatia, in Galatians 6. He says this, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path, and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Let's break this down. Galatians 6, he starts with, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin. So we're going to stop there for one quick second. The value of you belong here recognizes that sin is real. You are not primarily a good person. 
I am not primarily a good person. And I know that stings a little bit, but hear me out. You were created by God himself, which means you have intrinsic worth, but we sin, right? I sin, you sin, you have rejected God. You have tried to do life your own way. That's your desire, those are what your actions show. But if you don't understand this, you will misunderstand this whole value of you belong here. In fact, in another writing of Paul, he writes to the church in Corinth where they're not actually understanding this. So a guy in the church is actually sleeping with his stepmom and he's bragging about how open and accepting they are of his sin, of the church that he goes to. The problem is that they're not doing anything about his sin. They're just saying, grace, 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 grace. And the problem is no one is acknowledging the truth of this sin. The man himself is not saying, I have this sin, I need to stop doing it. He's bragging. And we do that. We're just like the church in Corinth. We have sin in our life, but instead of confronting it, we post about it online accompanied by the thoughts of what I feel can't be wrong. I'm just trying my best. Leave me alone. You were created by God, so you have intrinsic worth, but you sin. You're broken. And until we acknowledge that we have sin in our life that Jesus needs to work on and that it's messy, you can't really be part of the church the way that God designed it to function. Now, I'm not saying that your faith isn't valid, and I get that we're all on journeys and it takes us a while to get to certain places. But if you aren't trying to get to a place where you are honest about your sin, then you're just never going to experience church the way that Jesus wants you to. And it's probably always going to feel very surfacey. And you belong here is about sin and brokenness in our life, but it's not about a specific sin. And here's what I mean by that. When Collective first started, uh, there were some things that came up that I've actually never experienced before in ministry people who were actively struggling with addiction, people who had attempted suicide or were struggling with suicidal thoughts, people who were openly sleeping around with no remorse. And I remember sitting at home with my wife and talking and just saying, I don't know if I'm cut out to be a pastor, right? Because I've never been through these things before, so I don't know how to help people. I don't know how to encourage people. I don't know how to help people pull themselves out of that sin and out of what's going on in their life and move toward what God wants them to. But my wife who's smarter than me, which I said last week, I'm just gonna tell you every week so you know, um, reminded me that I don't have to go through something to care for people. And that opened my eyes and set me free as a pastor to care for people and serve other people. Because I realized that my ability to care for people is not based on what I have or haven't done. It's not based on what has or hasn't happened to me. You belong here isn't about what I did. It's about what the thing I did is doing to me. It's about that brokenness. Brene Brown talks about this exact same thing when she talks about empathy. She defines empathy as feeling with people. And she explains it like this. Somebody you know has fallen into a deep hole and they're shouting out from the bottom that they're stuck, that it's dark, that they're overwhelmed. And empathy is climbing down into the hole and saying, I know it's dark down here, you are not alone. It's not, here's my story. It's not, how, here's how I got out of this place. It's not, I did it, so therefore you can do it too, right? It's connecting with something in myself that knows that feeling. That's what we're talking about when we talk about you belong here. It's connecting with that brokenness. So because I'm a sinner, I can say to people, you belong here. See, the thing is just on the surface, and the thing is addiction or the marriage fight or the lies, but you belong here is deeper than that. It's about sin and shame and guilt and insecurity. It's about the things that make me put up a front because I need to manufacture what other people think about me. It's about my need to be in control all the time. It's about the shame that comes back up to the surface at every major milestone in my life. So anybody who's running after Jesus can say, you belong here to someone who has fallen because they know what it's like. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to walk right up to somebody who's struggling with something in their life, whether that's brokenness or the loss of a family member, anything, and put my arm around them and say, I have pain too, because I don't really know what their pain is like. But I will put an arm around them and I'll cry with them. And when the conversation gets to the point where they start to wonder about doubt and anger and fear, Then I can say, let's talk about it because I know how that feels. Let's go back to verse one. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, 
Now, notice that Paul is writing about another believer, someone who has put their faith in Jesus, someone who has said, Jesus is the leader of my life. And this is really important. And this comforts me because he doesn't say that once you become a Christian, that everything has to work out perfectly. Right? It's the reminder that there will be brokenness and pain in our life. This is why you belong here is the answer to a lot of the problems uh, that you have with church. You were pointed at. People made you feel bad. They said you can't be here like that or do that thing or have that addiction. They condemned you and made a big deal of something that Jesus never made a big deal about. And so you left. Right? At some point you got to that place where you're like, I'm done with church and I don't blame you. So when people say you belong here, they're not saying, here's how you screwed up, so go change. They're saying, here's how I messed up. Here's how I'm leaning on Jesus because I'm broken. Let me say it like this. The difference between a community I want to be a part of and one I will run from is the difference between someone saying, you should be here and you belong here. Also, notice Paul uses the word overcome. So this isn't just some kind of slip and fall, is that you're completely overcome and dominated by this sin. Collective is not a club for people who have it all together. We're a hospital for sick people. Do you know how sick people act? Sick. Right? How ridiculous would it be if Elise or Harper came down with the flu and they came to me and said they want to cuddle, that they want to be held by their dad, they want me to help them get better, but instead of doing that, I point my finger at them and say, you better get it together. I don't know why you're acting sick. You better be healthy if you want to be a part of this family. And that's the picture of what Paul is talking about. He says, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. Now, really quickly, when he says that you who are godly, it doesn't mean you who have never sinned. The way you become godly through scripture is the sacrifice of Jesus. Paul actually writes this in 2 Corinthians. He says this, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So in Jesus, we can become the righteousness of God. Right? I am the righteousness of God. The way you become truly godly is become righteous through the grace that he offers you. And so if you have accepted Jesus as the leader of your life, Scripture says you are godly. Now you might not feel that way, Your life might not reflect that all the time. But if you've put your faith in him, he says you're godly. But because you are godly, you help the person in your life who is overcome by sin, and you do so with gentleness and humility. When my kids are sick, I don't punish them. I don't yell at them to get better. I don't kick them out of the house. I say gently and humbly, here's some medicine. Try these fluids. And my favorite part, come here and let's cuddle. Paul continues in verse 2. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. And the law of Christ is just simply to love one another. It's to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when it says the, the phrase share each other's burdens, this word is really interesting in the Bible because it's the exact same words that's used in multiple different stories. It actually paints a really good picture of what this word means. One time this word is used in reference to men carrying a coffin in a funeral procession. One time this word is used in regard to an expectant mother. Another time this word is used in reference to a group of men who are carrying their friend who's disabled to Jesus, hoping that Jesus will heal him. So every time this word is used in scripture, it's not talking about a little thing going on in our life. It's a big burden. It's difficult. It's hard to carry. Being open about your brokenness is hard. You belong here as a value is hard to carry. And that's why it's rare. It's easier to have a community where everybody's goal is just to be nice and say, Jesus loves me and go home. But Jesus wants to give you life to the full. And the thing that's keeping you from experiencing the life and the freedom and the hope that Jesus offered is sin. And what that looks like is that you're dealing with these difficult experiences that you've had. And here's the thing, you know this, when you deal with it, you usually have to deal with it over and over and over again. It's never one and done. Different parts of your life will bring these things back out. To be honest, a lot of this is probably dealing with your family of origin. It was how you were raised, how you weren't raised, who was there, who wasn't there, what was said, what they did, what they didn't do, but it's not limited to that. You belong here is all about addiction and loneliness, pain, 
failure, fear, insecurity, and the list goes on. And you belong here is hard. It takes work and it takes community. And so let me ask you this, and some of you may need to listen to God right now. Who in your life needs a text today from you? Who do you need to call? Who do you need to cancel your plans for so you can take them out to dinner? There are burdens that you are being asked to carry and other people are being asked to carry yours as well. And it may be inconvenient and it may be difficult, but I bet they'll remember it. And I like the next verse a lot uh, that Paul says. Now, I'm a direct person, but Paul is more direct than I am, so it makes me feel good about myself. And this is what he says in Galatians 3. If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Now, I like this verse, uh, but this isn't the verse you post on Monday morning on Instagram for your Monday motivation. You don't see this cross-stitched on your grandma's throw pillow. And we have a lot of tattoos at Collective, a lot of Jesus tattoos at Collective. No one has this tattoo, right? But this is an important reminder. You need someone in your life that's going to remind you that you are not that big of a deal. For me, that's my four-year-old. At least reminds me that I'm not that big of a deal because here's what tends to happen on Sunday mornings or Sunday afternoons for me. So I work hard all week, lead this staff, we do church, I'll preach two sermons, it's great. Most of the time I'm like feeling pretty good about it. Uh, people afterward will come up and say, hey, uh, this, I've never heard it said that way or this impacted me or I'm going to go do this thing. So I feel pretty good most Sundays. But then what happens is I get home and as soon as I walk in the door, Elise is sitting on the couch and as soon as I walk in and say hi to her, she goes, dad, I'm hungry. I'm like, okay, I'll go get you a snack. So I go get her a snack. And while I'm doing that, she's gonna go, she tells me that she has to go potty. And about a minute later, she's on the toilet, toilet yelling, Dad, I'm done. And that grounds me pretty quickly. She doesn't care that I'm the lead pastor of Collective. She doesn't care that I worked all week to write this sermon. She doesn't care that I preached two services. She only cares that I wipe her fast enough that she doesn't miss a part of her show. Right? Do you know that you are not that big of a deal? Do you have someone or something in your life that keeps you grounded? Now, one of the things for me is when I see people at Collective who serve on Sunday mornings, I'm reminded every single week that they don't think they're that big of a deal. There are people here every weekend that run entire teams at work, or run their own business, or manage multi-million dollar budgets. They lead whole classrooms of influencers of the next generation during the week. There are people here that should tell you that they're called doctor. So Monday through Friday, they're a big deal. But come Sunday, they're waking up early to push bins. They're sitting on the floor playing with three-year-olds. They're handing out programs. They're going over the song one more time. They recognize I am not that big of a deal. And for me, that motivates me. And here's why I say all this. You belong here is ultimately all about Jesus. We are selfish and we are sinful. But God sent his son Jesus to die for us. And if you trust him, he will take your sin and he will give you his perfection. And so today isn't just about what happened or what is happening. It's ultimately about what God is able to do in us. It's about grace and truth. It's not about wallowing in self-pity. It's not I'm so messed up and so are you and let's just sit in misery together. And it's also not the opposite where you put on a facade every single week and you show up at church and you pretend like everything's fine and as soon as you get in your car, you start crying because it's not okay. This is about how Jesus is changing us. It's about how Jesus is bringing grace to my pain and truth to my insecurity and grace to my anger and truth to my fears. So we say you belong here because for reasons that we don't even fully understand, Jesus has said those same words to us when he invited us into a relationship with God. We do not belong in that relationship, but God looks right at us every single day and every single moment and says you belong here. So if you are broken, if you have sin in your life that you can't get control of, we believe the best thing for you to do is give your life to Jesus. He loves you. He has always loved you, and he's been working everything in your life to get you to the point where you are ready to embrace him and the life that he has for you. I want to read one more scripture in Hebrews 4. This is what it says. It says, this high priest, where they're referencing Jesus, of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So do you know what that means? 
It means that whatever you are going through, whatever you are going through, when you say to Jesus, I am struggling, he understands. So if you come to the end of your rope, if you try to do life by yourself and it isn't working, if you need somebody to help you, somebody who conquered death, who will never leave you, who will never forsake you, who will pick you up whenever you fall and show you a better way to live, who is returning one day to claim you as his own so your past is forgiven and your present has peace and your future is secure, then the thing that you need to do is give your life to Jesus. It's the same thing we say every single week. When you're in that place and ready to have that conversation, all you have to do is check off baptism on your connection card and we will start to talk about it. We will wrestle with you about it. We will pray with you about it. I will answer any question that I can about it. Now, if you've accepted Jesus, it means you are a part of his community called the church. It means you have to take the risk to put yourself out there. See, everybody loves being part of a community where other people say you belong here, but it's hard to be the one to actually do it. Like, that's the perfect world. We'd love to be in that place. But it's on us to actually say it. And it's hard to do. And if you don't do it, we can't be that community. And so will you take a risk? Will you be a part and live an authentic community? Will you be someone who says, my life is broken, but here's how Jesus is changing me? In Japan... There's a type of art where people repair broken pottery with gold, and it's called kintsugi. And the philosophy is that it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to be disguised. Right? It points out the flaws in the dish. The artist will actually join pieces of pottery together and give them a new life, give them a more refined aspect. And you'll see irregular patterns that get formed that are enhanced by beauty of the gold. And kintsugi is about pottery that becomes more beautiful for being broken. That is what the church is supposed to look like. This community is more beautiful when we recognize our brokenness and we're real about it. And so I want to end by reminding you and reminding us that we're all in this together. And so I want to remind you who is here and who is with you and who wants to share your burdens. And so I'm going to read a few sentences and, that describe people that go to this church and what they're going through. And remember, they might not be going through the same thing that you're going through. It might not be something that's a part of your past. It might not be something that's part of your present. It might not be something that's part of your future. But you'll recognize that you understand that pain, that you understand that brokenness that you have the same, same shame too, and you need help. And we're here for that. So here's some of the people that go to this church. There's someone here looking for a job, and each day that passes chips away at their self-esteem a little bit more. So to the hopeless, you belong here. There's a couple who's over trying to make it work, and they're bitter, and they're annoyed, and they're hurt, and they're hopeless. And if they could describe their marriage in one word, it would be whatever. So to the apathetic, you belong here. You and your spouse want a baby. Everywhere you look, you see baby announcements and people buying strollers, but every month it doesn't happen for you, and you wonder if something's wrong with you. So to the anxious, you belong here. You gave church a shot, but someone in authority took advantage of you, and you decided to shut yourself off ever since. To the burned, you belong here. Your finances are a mess. And it's not so much the debt that stresses you out. It's the feeling behind it that says a real man could provide for his family and it's crushing you. To the insecure, you belong here. You have a friend who just lost a family member. And not only are you sad, but it's welling up inside you questions about whether or not God is fair. You begin to ask, is he not loving? Why didn't he intervene? Do I care more about this than he did? To the hurting, you belong here. Your spouse left and you're tired, you're alone. Your life will never be the same because of them, but to the lonely, you belong here. See, there's a community here that's devoted to each other. And we found grace and truth in Jesus. We know we don't deserve it, but we give freely to, to, each, other, to each other of our time and our money, our relationships and our emotions. When somebody falls, we pick them up. 
When you struggle, we will pray. If you fall for the 100th time, we're not gonna give up on you, so you shouldn't give up on yourself either. And we want you to be a part of this community. We want you to live this out. We want you to breathe it. We want it to infiltrate your soul. Because we believe when you do that, you will experience life the way it was meant to be lived. And here's why, because Jesus is our hope. His church is our community. And this place is full of broken people. This place is full of messed up, sinful, selfish people. Now we have intrinsic worth because God created us and we have the choice to accept that grace and be redeemed by Jesus, to put our faith in him, to allow ourselves to have new life, which means we're godly. And so our goal is that every single person in this room helps each other gently and humbly. No matter how long it takes, we're here for you. And we know that we are more beautiful for being broken. And because of that, you belong here. Let's pray. God, it seems... um, a little counterintuitive and countercultural uh, to uh, say we want the messiness. But God, we know uh, that we're all broken. And we're all messed up. And we all have sin in our lives that's ripping us apart. So God, as a church, when we say we want to be that church that's messy and that's broken, God, we know that what we're really saying is we need you to heal us. God, that we need you in this place to give us new life, to give us forgiveness, to give us redemption, to give us restoration. So God, that's what we pray for. God, we pray for a community of people that are real and honest and authentic. God, that we don't pretend like we have it all together, but on Sunday mornings and during the week and whatever we do as a community, this is a place where you can show up and just be who you are, mess and all. God, that we don't have to pretend like everything's together because we follow you. God, that, that we can be honest about it and how you're working in our lives. God, help us be that church. Help us be that community. Help us be the type of people that are so in tune to our brokenness and our sin that when other people come into our life, we can say, hey, you belong here. And we know that because we're broken and we need you. God, we pray for that. God, we pray that's the core of who this church is forever. God, that will always be the messy church because that means you're working in our lives. God, we love you and pray these things in your name. Amen.